These are the images of Tom Sutherland we all remember. Jubilant as he returns home to Colorado after his long years of captivity in Lebanon. But why did Tom and Gene Sutherland go to Beirut in the first place? They went to work at the American University of Beirut to help the Lebanese people build a better life. The American embassy was bombed just a few months before they went, and a few months after they arrived, the U.S. Marine barracks was blown up. It was clearly a dangerous time and a dangerous place, but as the title of their book suggests, they went at their own risk people came out here to the west in the early settlement days it wasn't exactly a safe and secure place in any means but that didn't stop Americans from coming out and settling this part of the world we had maybe two choices you cut and run and say it's dangerous we don't want to be here or you stay and do a job and we had contracted to do a job and somehow it did become kind of a mission because there was so much worthwhile there University professor Thomas Sutherland has disappeared June 9, 1985. In a scene recreated in an HBO movie, Sutherland is abducted by the Islamic Jihad. He writes that he wasn't afraid, that it all seemed like a dream. It was all kind of unreal, and you have that kind of exhilaration, and that lasted for two or three days. I thought, why, wow, not many people have this happened to them. I can write a book about this. But soon, the reality of his plight sunk in. After four weeks in captivity, he was locked up with chains around his ankles. I bent down and said, that's much too tight, much too tight, don't I? Boom! A big slap on my hand. And I thought, my God, that was a shock. I, mean, I hadn't had that done to me since I was in first grade or whatever. Back in Colorado, meanwhile, yellow ribbons are going up to show support for the Sutherland family. Through it all, Jean keeps her composure. If you cry and let down, um, I mean, you, you've lost it. I mean, there's nothing that you can do. But if you hang in there, there are things that you can do. Tom Sutherland, American University in Beirut. Tom Sutherland writes that when he was first kidnapped, he was sure it would last only a few days or weeks. He could not imagine he'd be in chains for the next six and a half years. Roger Wolf, 9 News, Northern Newsroom. Day after day, month after month, locked in dark dungeons, chained like animals, life for the hostages became a fight for survival. Sutherland writes that he felt agony, anger, and despair. I just decided I'm not going to let other men do this to me. I'm going to commit suicide. He used a plastic garbage bag to try to suffocate himself, but he couldn't go through with it when he saw in his mind's eye a picture of his wife and daughters. And I would see that vision come up and I'd think, can't do that to these women and leave them without a father and a husband. And I'd go, pull that thing off my head. And it would be, gasping for breath, and I honestly was right on the edge of going. So Sutherland chose life, but it was a horrible life, with every move controlled by dim-witted guards who treated the hostages with contempt. You get, you get a very solid impression of how it must be to be a minority, where people are, are looking askance at you and questioning your every move and looking down on you and treating you like dirt, you know? That, that really worked on my psyche. To keep their sanity, the hostages did everything they could to stimulate their minds. Professor Sutherland gave long lectures on genetics and other classes he'd taught. To keep your mind going, Roger, was absolutely vital. And it was our survival, calling on our education and calling on our memories and challenging our minds all the time. We also read hundreds and hundreds of books. And they played games with cards made from cut up Kleenex boxes. They had to hide their cards from the guards who didn't approve of gambling. They would say we were gambling and we'd say, gambling, come on, what are we gonna gamble with? You got nothing except you, what you bring into us. But they weren't very rational, of course, about all of that. 16 times Sutherland was moved to different dungeons. Each trip was harrowing. Sometimes the hostages were virtually encased in plastic tape they taped me up and tip of the toe 
to the top of my head with a little space to breathe out of, and that was it. Around and around and around. It was absolutely stiff, like an Egyptian mummy. In all the years Sutherland was held captive, only twice did messages get through from his family. One was a valentine printed in a Beirut newspaper, a family picture showing his new granddaughter. Oh, I just can't tell you how, how emotional that was to realize that the world was going on there and that new children were being born who were my grandchildren, you know. It was, it was an extremely moving uh, experience for me to get that valentine. It would be another three and a half years of cold chains and stifling cells before Sutherland is reunited with his family and finally gets to hold his granddaughter. Roger Wolf, 9 News, Northern Newsroom. For six and a half years, life for Tom Sutherland was a marathon, mind-numbing struggle for survival. 2,354 days of dark dungeons, cold chains, blindfolds, and boredom. Finally, on November 18, 1991, Sutherland heard the words that would end his captivity. The guard comes through the door and he says, we have good news for you today. Terry Anderson says, like what? And they said, today, Mr. Waite and Mr. Sutherland go home. And I said, yeah, but have a do. The very next day, Sutherland was at the U.S. Army Hospital in Wiesbaden, Germany, where he was reunited with his family. A moment so tender, he can barely describe it. The door starts to open a little bit, and there was Kit peeking around the edge of the door. And right behind her, Jean. Oh, God. <laughs> I can't, can't tell you how, how emotional that was for me, Roger. I, I don't mean to get too emotional now, but that really, after six and a half years of waiting for that. The next day, a composed and confident Tom Sutherland dazzles the world media with his tales of captivity. While other hostages have had to cope with serious emotional problems, not so for Sutherland. And I can honestly say I have never had a bad dream about all of that. When I stepped out of that room there in the Beka in Baalbek, I figured, man, I'm free. I'm going to enjoy this freedom. And so it was a jubilant Tom Sutherland who arrived back in Colorado to receive a rousing welcome. Thousands lined the streets as his motorcade drove through Fort Collins. For the whole Sutherland family, it was symbolic of the support they received during this long ordeal. And they showed it in their hometown, in the Moby Jim, and the, and the uh, bagpipers, and the people just thousands and thousands of people and little children who hadn't been born, you know, when he was taken or ever known him at all. Um, it just humbles you terribly much. While Sutherland clearly relishes his freedom, he writes in his book that captivity wasn't entirely a negative experience, that there were actually lessons to be learned from those years in shackles. In truth, I came out of captivity a wiser and more educated man than when I went in, more educated about myself, about others, and about the life of the mind. And there isn't a place for bitterness in me about the whole thing. Since his return, Sutherland has become a popular inspirational speaker. He's been all over the country sharing his story and his message. I hope to um, let people know what a wonderful thing freedom is, what a wonderful thing an education is, what a wonderful place America is to live in. And I think we all take some of these things too much for granted. Tom Sutherland takes nothing for granted anymore. He rejoices in his family and savors his freedom. Roger Wolf, 9 News, Northern Newsroom.